Hello students, welcome back to another episode of Principles of Micro. So right now we're in chapter 16, talking about consumer choice. And we just went over this hugely important concept of diminishing marginal utility. Go back and look at that last episode if you're a little bit unsure about this or need some review. So when I tell people about diminishing marginal utility, a common objection I hear is, what about addiction? What about someone who just gets hooked on drugs and they find they can't really stop themselves, shouldn't diminishing marginal utility mean that the utility of drugs goes down and down and down until it's no longer worth it? Well, it turns out that even addiction can still be compatible with diminishing marginal utility. So here's how you can make that happen. So let's say that the marginal utility from drugs is given by this blue line over here and sure enough, it is diminishing as the law of diminishing marginal returns, sorry, diminishing marginal utility tells us. But perhaps it's diminishing asymptotically. And the marginal cost of doing drugs could be rising asymptotically. It could be such a way that even though these curves are always getting closer and closer and closer together, they never quite meet. So for this person, even though they have diminishing marginal utility, the benefits of doing drugs always exceed the costs, so they keep doing drugs more and more and more, and they fall into addiction. So addiction does not necessarily violate this principle of diminishing marginal returns. So to be sure, of course, don't do drugs. I do not recommend them. But it can be consistent with economic theory. So here's another example I heard about. It was written by um, a psychologist who also did some work in behavioral economics. He wrote about something he called scope neglect. So in a survey, they asked the subjects, how much money would you pay to save some number of birds? So one group was asked, how much you would be willing to pay to save 2,000 birds? Another group was asked, how much you would pay to save 20,000? And the third group was asked about saving 200,000. So when they go and do their math, they found out and took the averages. The group that was asked about 2,000 birds was willing to pay $80 to save them. Now the other group that's saving 200,000 birds was only willing to pay eight more dollars. So the psychologist talked about as being some kind of bias in human behavior and some evidence of irrationality. He said that the number of birds being saved was going up by entire orders of magnitude, but the amount that people were going to pay to save them was barely budging. He was saying that the willingness to pay was not keeping pace with the amount of birds you're saving, and that was a bias. He called that scope neglect. That people are failing to scale up for how many birds they were saving. So I read this, I was rather amused by it because this is actually not irrationality at all or some kind of bias in human behavior. Actually, it's entirely consistent with economic theory. This is just our friend diminishing marginal utility. So if you pay $1 to have one slice of cake, but you're unwilling to pay $10,000 for 10,000 slices of cake, are you irrational? Of course not. It's just because you have diminishing marginal utility for extra slices of cake. So one slice for $1 may well be worthwhile. However, because utility is diminishing, or sorry, because marginal utility is diminishing, buying 10,000 pieces for $10,000 does not make sense. Likewise, saving 2,000 birds for $80 could be reasonable, but saving 200,000 birds for, I guess it'd be um, $8,000 would perhaps not be reasonable because that there could be diminishing marginal utility to saving birds, just like there's diminishing marginal utility for everything else. So a lot of things that sometimes get labeled as biases or irrationality is actually consistent with economics. There's a lot of nonsense social science journalism out there, which is badly misinformed, saying that economic assumptions are untrue, but they end up doing 
some bad misrepresentation of what economics is really about. So here's a preview of an idea we'll talk more about later. One thing that happens because of the diminishing marginal utility is that you might see quantity discounts. You might see signs like this in a store, buy one, get one, 50% off. So why would a store do that instead of trying to get people to pay the full price for an extra item? Well, they know that consumers have diminishing marginal utility. So while I pay $1 for one slice of cake, paying $2 for two slices might not be worthwhile because there's diminishing marginal utility to cake. To get me to buy a second unit, you gotta offer me some kind of discount. So if you make the second unit 50% off, now it could be worthwhile even though I have diminishing marginal utility. Now, it's not always gonna work out, but if it's still profitable to sell a discount and you get people to buy extra units by enticing them with these discounts, that could be better for both the firm and the consumer to have these discounts. So that's a little bit of an idea of what you'll see later on. We'll talk more about this in chapter 11, but its roots come from diminishing marginal utility. All right, with all that in hand, we can now talk about optimal consumption. So that is making the best possible consumption choice within your budget constraint. So the best choice means you're trying to make yourself as happy as possible, the most possible satisfaction, the biggest total utility you can possibly get. So to keep things simple, we'll look at just two goods. Um, the same principles though extend to three or more goods. So don't worry about this being oversimplified. Our two example goods will be broccoli and chocolate. So I'll call MUB the marginal utility you get from broccoli. So if I have one more piece of broccoli, how much extra happiness do I get? That's what this number is going to represent. MUC is going to be the marginal utility from chocolate, the extra happiness I get from another piece of chocolate. PB is going to be the price of broccoli, and PC is price of chocolate. Now, one very important figure is the ratio of marginal utility to the price. So MUB over PB is how much marginal utility, how much extra utility I receive if I spend one more dollar on broccoli. The analogous concept for chocolate is MUC over PC. The bonus utility I'm gonna get when I spend a dollar on chocolate. So we'll now try to figure out what the optimal consumption looks like. That is, what's our best possible option? So what if we have MUC over PC, this marginal utility per dollar for chocolate, being bigger than marginal utility per dollar with broccoli? That means if I spend one more dollar, my last dollar in chocolate, it's gonna give me more utility than I would have gotten if I had spent my last dollar on broccoli. So what I wanna do is shift my consumption to start buying more chocolate and buying less broccoli because that would raise my total utility. Now here's an important concept. If it's possible to raise your utility, then your utility must not have been maximized, right? If your utility had been maximized, it would be impossible to do any better. That's what maximum means. So here, spending more money on chocolate and less on broccoli can make you happier. So what you're doing before must not have been the best. So this scenario cannot be the best. So let's look at the opposite. What if the marginal utility per dollar for chocolate is smaller than marginal utility per dollar for broccoli. In that case, I could make myself happier by spending more money on broccoli, 
gives me more bang for my buck, so to say, than on chocolate. So I'll start buying more broccoli and less chocolate, and that will raise my happiness. I'll make me happier, so that means that my old decision, where this was true, could not have been the best. Again, if you've been maximizing, it would be impossible to raise your utility. So this case also can be ruled out as not being the best. So if you're optimizing, if you're making the best possible choice within your budget, it must be the case that marginal utility per dollar is equal for the two goods. So there is some intuition for that. So if the marginal utility per dollar is equal, that means that if I spend a lot of dollar on chocolate versus spending a lot of dollar on broccoli, they're both equally good to me. So I can't possibly improve my utility. If I can't improve, it must be a case I'm already at the best. So you have to have equal margin utility per dollar for all goods when you're making the best choice. Now perhaps you're wondering, I like chocolate a lot more than broccoli, so is it always better to spend more money on chocolate? The answer is no. Remember, diminishing margin utility. If you already had 10 pieces of chocolate, and you're thinking about piece number 11, then that extra utility is going to be pretty small. If you haven't had any veggies, no broccoli, then that's not very good for your diet, not very good for your energy levels. So margin utility for broccoli could be quite high. So you're not going to spend all your money on chocolate and none on broccoli. There is some right balance, and that right balance is when the margin utility per dollar is equal. So oftentimes, economic textbooks rewrite this formula in a different way. So you put all the marginal utilities on one side and the prices on the other, and you get this. The marginal utility ratio for X and Y has to equal the price ratio if you're making the best possible consumption choice. So there is intuition for that as well. So the MU ratio is the rate at which you're willing to trade the two goods. So the marginal utility of chocolate is two and the marginal utility of broccoli is one. That means you need to tra you're willing to trade two broccoli for one chocolate. So two broccoli would give you two times one, which is two extra utils. One chocolate also gives you two extra utils. So two extra broccoli and one extra chocolate are the same to you. That's the rate you're willing to exchange two broccoli for one chocolate. Now the price ratio is the other side of that equation. So let's say the price of chocolate is eight and the price of broccoli is two. In that case, the cost of four broccoli is the same as the cost of one chocolate. So this ratio you can trade them in the marketplace is four to one. So the price ratio is the rate you can trade in the market and the marginal utility ratio is the rate you're willing to trade based on your preferences. So those two ratios have to be the same. You have to have MU ratio equal the price ratio if you're making the best possible consumption choice. Why is that? Well, it means that the rate you're willing to trade and the rate you can actually trade are the same, so you can't possibly improve. If those rates were different, then you could do better. So if you're willing to trade two broccoli for one chocolate, but in the market you can only trade one broccoli for one chocolate, in that case, you can change your consumption and end up making yourself better off. So you probably want to buy more chocolate and less broccoli in that case, because chocolate gives you two extra utils and broccoli only gives you one. They have the same price. So you want to have equal marginal utility per dollar or equivalently marginal utility ratio equals price ratio.